My name is James Gigaha and I'm the editor of New Mandala. Welcome to New Mandala TV. Today gives me great pleasure to be joined by a major star and player in Malaysian politics, Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmed. Nick is a Selangor State Minister and head of the People's Justice Party Youth Branch. Nick, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. The first question I have for you, if we cast our eyes over the last few weeks in Malaysian politics, it's fair to say it's been fairly chaotic, particularly <laughs> yeah. with the unravelling of the opposition movement. Is Pakatan Rakyat dead? Well, definitely um, the opposition coalition, Pakatan Rakyat, is now uh, informally uh, does not exist anymore. I mean, that's uh, certain. Um, what is happening now is that uh, uh, we are trying to form a new movement um, based on the same spirit of, of Pakatan Rakyat. And what would this movement encompass? Who will be part of this? Well, uh, you know, there, there are talks within certain uh, segments of PAS um, forming a new uh, uh, organisation uh, as well as uh, PKR or the People's Justice Party and the Democratic Action Party will be part of this movement. And what do you think the unravelling of Pakatan Rakyat means for Malaysia's opposition movement? And what does it mean for democracy in Malaysia in general? Definitely for the time being, it's a setback uh, because I think uh, many people hoped that uh, Pakatan can uh, go far and it has certainly uh, achieved a lot. It's the most successful opposition coalition to date in the country. Uh, and uh, many of the ideas, you know, encompassing uh, both uh, uh, non-Malay parties, uh, mixed parties as well as an Islamist party is something which I would, I would think is representative of the entire spectrum of Malaysian society and uh, whatever new movement or new coalition that comes into being will have to also uh, take into account of the same uh, uh, constituencies. So as you mentioned in 2013, the last general elections in Malaysia, Pakatan Rakyat won the popular vote yes. and took uh, the ruling coalition Barisan Nasional right down to the wire. Does the opposition movement stand much hope of winning or even challenging strongly in elections in 2018? I definitely think so. I mean, the, the challenge for us is to get uh, things in order. Uh, and, and I think uh, everyone is working hard on that uh, at the moment. Uh, and I think uh, if, if that can be settled quickly, uh, because at the same time, uh, the ruling coalition is also facing its own challenges. Uh, and I, I certainly believe that, that we can uh, mount a serious challenge uh, going to the, 20, uh, the, the next uh, general election. I guess part of the complication for the coalition was a perceived lack of leadership once Anwar Ibrahim was jailed on his latest charges of sodomy. Uh, effectively, this jailing and sentencing means he's out of politics well until after 2018. Who do you think can lead? Uh, inspire and progress Malaysia's opposition movement now? Well, I think the collective uh, loss uh, of uh, the imp first the imprisonment of Anwar Ibrahim, but earlier on, the passing on of uh, Karpal Singh from the DAP and uh, Nick Aziz from PAS, uh, both had, all, all three had a major impact in, in the uh, coalition, in the opposition coalition. Um, and, uh, you know, Anwar continues to be a major factor. I mean, he continues to, to be an influence even uh, from prison. Uh, but at the same time, I think we can see an emergence uh, of many uh, leaders. Um, Dr. Wan Aziza is now the opposition leader, his uh, wife and the uh, president of PKR. Uh, even if you see it within PKR, you know, we are not, um, we, we do not have, uh, we are not limited in terms of number of leaders that are emerging within the party. Uh, we have uh, the Chief Minister of Slango, uh, Azmin Ali. We have the Party Secretary General and Vice President Rafizi Ramli. Uh, we have Tian Chua, we have Daryl Liking from Sabah. And these are all making their own name. Nurul Iza, uh, you know, uh, the Party Vice President, they are all making their own name uh, and, and uh, within the party and, and the country. So I think, uh, and the same goes with the other parties. So I, I certainly think that uh, we are not uh, lacking of, of figures to lead uh, the uh, coalition. And while a successful opposition coalition, I guess it's fair to say that in many ways it was tenuous, if not a marriage of convenience 
it was possibly a marriage of tolerance. How do you think the opposition movement can get beyond uh, questions of ethnicity, religion, and focus on being successful as it was in 2013? I think the main issue is that we need to learn from both the successes and our shortcomings uh, within Pakatan, right? Yeah. Uh, we had many successes uh, within Pakatan, but at the same time, yes, as you mentioned, there are shortcomings. Uh, and, and so we need to see, and that's why, you know, there's this new movement within PAS uh, that is uh, f uh, starting to form. And I think, uh, uh, you know, that probably will be able to sit better uh, with the other uh, part, uh, parties. So, uh, and there needs to be stronger institutions uh, to, to make the coalition work. Uh, previously, it was uh, much more of a loose coalition. Um, so, we need to make it more formal and more institutionalised uh, in order for it to function effectively. Now, if we could turn our attention to some other recent events, and in particular the extraordinary claims from the Wall Street Journal that Prime Minister Najib Razak has siphoned off $700 million from the indebted state sovereign fund 1MDB. An interim government report says that it's found nothing suspicious about the money transfer so far. In light of this, as well as the recent property scandal in Australia which was exposed by the Age newspaper, what are the implications for Prime Minister Najib? I think it's massive. Um, uh, the 1MDB issue uh, has been haunting him for a long time. But the fact that uh, the, there are two major incidents, I would say. First, uh, earlier on, there was a property transaction involving the pilgrimage fund, Tabung Haji. And this is something which is very close to the hearts of many Muslims in the country. Uh, on the ground, so uh, because this is where they save in order to perform their pilgrimage, uh, so that is one that made it, you know, rather than being an abstract corruption scandal to something that is very real and affected them. Secondly, this uh, transfer, which until today the prime minister has not actually denied, his statement is that he did not uh, use the money for personal ends. Uh, that is against, you know, it's a, such a blatant uh, act that many, you know, at first could not believe someone would do. So that has put a lot of pressure and uh, to the point that even uh, many prominent cabinet members uh, of the ruling party has actually come up with strongly worded statements um, that is not supportive of the Prime Minister. So he is in a very difficult position at, the ti uh, f uh, at this time, uh, although I would say he still has some support within his party that, that is... Um, allowing him to survive. And what does this all say about the state of politics at the moment in Malaysia? Well, I mean, yeah, it, it shows how bad corruption has become in the country that these things can happen. Or, and, and the simple fact that, uh, you know, such a blatant act uh, could take place. I mean, you know, they did not even bother to disguise uh, or come up with a more complex arrangement uh, for, for this. I mean, corruption is something which is normal uh, and, and has plagued the country, especially since the reign of uh, Dr. Mahade, uh, when a lot of the country's institutions were destroyed. But this has really taken it to a different level altogether. Uh, and I think many people are disgusted. Um, people are openly talking about it. Civil servants, um, you know, people in the streets are openly talking about this uh, at this point of time. So I think... Uh, it is something which is a major issue in Malaysia. If we look at last year's elections in Indonesia yeah. and the seemingly great gains that democracy has made in that country mm. in such a short time, yeah. and we compare that to the current state of play in Malaysia, would you say that Malaysia is in danger of falling behind? And how might be the people be galvanised by this prospect? Yes, I certainly think so. Because um, if we look at, the, at history, um, uh, Indonesia, when they had their crisis in 1997-98, uh, the old regime was overthrown and a process of democratization has taken place, impressive democratization. Um, you know, the institutions are free, um, you know, there's been major corruption investigations even against the government uh, parties. Uh, the media is free, you know, uh, and, and political change happens bet uh, uh, between one election and another, 
uh, normally. So that that has been a huge success for Indonesia. Uh, Malaysia, on the other hand, um, we had our reformasi as well in 1998 when Anwar was set. Um, it created a new political movement, but from then until today, although the movement has grown, made it's much more multiracial uh, now and all that, but the, the fact remains that the old regime remains. So a lot of things that, that, uh, that was wrong in the past still is there right now. Uh, and and it's a stumbling block block to demo democracy, so I think we need to push for that, and and that's why my my main message when I meet Malaysians in, uh, in Australia is that we must not lose hope in 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 uh, this because until and unless there is one political change in the regime and institutional reform in the country, we will not see uh, real change taking place. There's no use if saying just Najib. Uh, resigning, but if there's another person of the same party of the same regime, uh, and you know, take, uh, coming into power, then uh, things will still be the same. Now, in addition to the potential cloud of corruption overhanging Malaysian politics at the moment, there's also the question of you know more aggressive moves towards Hudud law in Malaysia. Some commentators have remarked that Malaysia is now slipping towards fundamentalism. What would you say to those claims? I would say that uh, you know the the, the uh, religion is incre increasingly becoming a political uh, battleground in Malaysia, and it's being made use of, uh, including by people in AMNO. Uh, I we know for a fact that many many people in AMNO do not really uh, care about religion per se, and they themselves do not really lead uh, say religious lives. Uh, but they make use of it because for them they saw that this was uh, issue an issue that would uh, break the opposition apart and they have been proven right. Uh, it was unfortunate that people fell for it uh, and uh, as you probably know, until today actually the, hudud, the, the, um, the constitutional bill uh, to allow Hudud to be implemented uh, in, in Kelantan uh, has not been actually brought to parliament although it was scheduled to be brought uh, twice. The private members' bill it has been postponed and postponed. So I don't think the ruling coalition is serious about it because uh, um, one, they don't really believe in it, and secondly, if uh, even if they do, uh, there are non-Muslim component parties or even the Borneo parties, uh, which uh, some of them are Muslim but they have a different view about the implementation of Hudud or, or the Sharia uh, uh, criminal enactment that they do not want this to happen. So uh, it's more of, you know, it's being used as a political football in order to break the opposition apart. Uh, it is worrying, I agree, uh, because race and religion are so intertwined in Malaysia uh, and people make use of it. But, uh, and, and there's a marginalization of genuine, authentic, uh, moderate uh, religious voices, uh, which I think we still need to engage them because that is the only counter uh, to this. Not a pure secular voice, but genuine, moderate, uh, authentic religious voices to counter extremism in the country. And in March, Nick, you were arrested and detained for three days for what was labelled by the authorities as an unlawful mm -hmm. rally. Do you think Malaysia is slipping towards authoritarianism? And what can be done to arrest any potential trend in this way? Yeah, um, well, in fact, uh, um, yeah, they, they claimed that I was conducting an unlawful rally. Uh, but in fact, uh, earlier on, I had managed to successfully challenge uh, in the courts the Peaceful Assembly Act, uh, which uh, legislates uh, um, peaceful rallies in Malaysia. Um, so basically now, there's, uh, the courts recognise the fundamental constitutional guarantees of freedom to assembly. Uh, yet, yes, I was arrested and, and uh, after I was arrested, many other opposition uh, leaders and, um, and activists and NGO activists were arrested as well, uh, either under that uh, charge or the sedition laws, uh, and which has been increasingly used to subdue the opposition. Whereas, uh, not that I'm calling for the use of sedition law, but the supposed uh, purpose of sedition law, i.e. to protect uh, racial and religious harmony in the country, is not being used. Sedition law is not being used on uh, government uh, politicians or those allied to the governments uh, when they uh, incite uh, racial and religious hatred. So you can see the double standards there. 
So yeah, um, um, we do see that uh, worrying trend towards uh, uh, towards an oppressive authoritarian state. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, increasingly more and more Malaysians are determined to speak out uh, and fight uh, this trend. Finally, Nick, you gave us an interview four years ago when you just um, come into Malaysian politics, elected as one of the youngest members to Malaysia's parliament. Uh, lots happened in that four-year period, but you remarked back then that you hope to make a mark by helping create a Malaysia where politics are defined not by race or religion or corruption, but by values. Has that come about? Do you have hope for that still? Where do you see Malaysian politics in another five years' time? Being an op opposition politician in Malaysia, you must always have hope, because or not, you won't be able to survive in this business. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that uh, the trend, the, the, the overall trend uh, is still positive. Uh, more and more Malaysians are speaking up. More and more Malaysians are, are interested in, in issues of policy uh, and, and how to make the country a better place. Uh, so I think that uh, we, we do see that trend. But uh, the, the important issue is that we must not lose track. Uh, sometimes it's easy to get disillusioned. Uh, or give up hope, um, you know, the imprisonment of Anwar, the, 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 the death of Karpal and Nick Aziz and all that. But we must continue to keep the torch uh, burning uh, and fight for change. And I believe that uh, if we continue that uh, with all that is happening, uh, we can see that change happening in Malaysia. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, Nick. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you.